So my name is Paul Prosiv. I come from Student Enrollment Services, and I was the High Impact Practices co-chair with Erica Klein. And this last summer, along with a lot of the people, actually some of which are in this room, um, worked on uh, two high impact practice areas in convening uh, practitioners across UW-Tacoma together. And um, we're gonna talk to you a little bit about um, some of that that went on, but um, I wanna also introduce Cindy. I've got a microphone right here. I'm Cindy Sharshman from the Office of Global Affairs and also involved with the High Impact Practices work group. Cool. And if DC Grant rolls in, I will greatly appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, whoa, we're just skipping around. Um, high impact practices, uh, kind of a buzzword sometimes, and I just want to go over um, fairly quickly what, what do we mean by that word. Um, it can be defined in two ways. Um, the American, or the Association of American Colleges and Universities kind of have 11 core high impact practices, things that universities can do to promote student success, persistence, et cetera. Um, and we'll get into that as well. Um, two of the things that we focused on um, in the high impact practices communities of practice group, it's a mouthful, were undergraduate research and service learning or community-based learning. Um, the other way to define it is through a number of characteristics. Um, these, there are eight, I won't go through all of them. Um, setting high performance expectations, um, getting kind of real world, uh, hands-on learning happening. We heard active learning from another group as well, um, and the list goes on. So they're not just, oh, we do this, I do service learning, it's, it's neat, you know, it's no, it, is there a depth to it? And to what level? And we oftentimes might assume certain things, so this communities of practice was really great to start the discussion about, well, what do we mean by these terms? And why do they matter? We know that um, from a number of different studies that they promote student persistence. Um, students are more likely to say that their educational experience was a positive one and they're satisfied with it, but they're also more likely to say that those high impact practices are associated with higher order learning, um, engaging with um, diverse discussions and with diverse others, um, effective teaching practices, collaborative learning, and a number of other things. So they're promoting our student success um, kind of in and out of the classroom with also some 21st century skills as well. All right, um, so as Paul mentioned, we're the HIPS community of, of practice and we're part of the Student Success Council um, uh, at the university and our goal is to promote and support high impact learning practices. Um, we, Paul just talked about the benefits of HIPS for our students and so we strive to provide access to them for all of our students, especially those that have traditionally been marginalized in higher education. A lot of our work is about community building so that we may share good practices, um, review existing research, and engage in professional dialogue. We also hope to reward students for participation in these practices and worked over the summer on a mechanism to designate research and community engaged learning courses so they show up in a student's academic record. Research shows that course-based undergraduate research is the most effective at ensuring access for students of all backgrounds and across majors. That means that the benefits of undergraduate research are enjoyed by a larger group of students as opposed to a select few who work one-on-one -on -one with faculty. And by the way, when I say undergraduate research, I also include scholarly work and creative expression. And so this is the course designations that we worked on over the summer. If a, for a course to be designated as a research focused course, significant and sustained effort must be dedicated to authentic research and scholarship. Course-based undergraduate research at UW-Tacoma takes many formats, including traditional classroom courses with a substantial re research project, but then there's also special topics courses that are usually smaller in size, like senior thesis and capstone courses, and of course, independent study. We published a report at the end of the summer that goes into more detail and can be found on the Student Success Council website. This same report also includes eight student learning outcomes that the com community of practice developed, and the expectation is that a majority of these learning outcomes should be met in a research-focused group course. And this is where DC would jump in. Uh, so 
Uh, I served with DC very quickly um, on this uh, small communities of practice group that came together over the summer. It was really important that we develop a uh, common language and so we spent a lot of time on like what does that mean? What does community engaged work mean here on campus and in an academic um, context? And we, it, Cindy had mentioned the R designation and uh, we had the S designation or the service designation and so this was a community group of faculty, staff members coming together to try to suss out, okay, what would be a good starting point for this conversation? And then how can we scaffold in maybe some key components um, that we would hope that university um, courses would have here on campus? And very quickly, I wanna mention just two things from DC's slide. One is that there's a lot of hemming and hawing over this little sentence right here in bold. Um, by a lot of faculty members and staff members, um, but experiential learning with community partners through mutually beneficial exchange of creativity, knowledge, and resources was kind of how we defined things. Um, so this faculty and uh, staff group came together um, based on and working off of some reports in the past, um, but eventually um, developed a little guide for faculty and staff um, so that it, they can start to designate those courses, those course designations. Those went also into a Carnegie classification for community engaged work um, that is currently um, being submitted. Um, so it was actually a tremendous amount of work and uh, a lot of wordplay and back and forth. Um, and the reports I'd really encourage you to look at online as well. Lastly, um, they came up with some recommendations really acknowledging that there's hundreds of courses that we uncovered through this process that are doing community engaged work. Um, now these hundreds of courses, so incredibly well done, and so I'm like, okay, maybe they're just trying it out and maybe they're struggling and moving on. And so to, we're doing this without uh, a centralized hub uh, where a lot of other universities have a centralized hub of support for community engaged work. And so that was one thing that I know that the community engaged um, group would like to point out, um, that we would like to get some resources and things of that nature. Um, and one of the other things was we'd like to get that designation and we'd like to know just basically like who's doing this and what does it mean if you have an R or an S designation and recently that was, uh, those designations were um, put through in um, our policy and curriculum committee. So that's really cool that um, those designations we're gonna be able to start to identify. And then once we know the what of what we're doing, and um, then maybe we can start some more university broad conversations about all the key components and some of the recommendations that this committee put together so that our community engaged work can be more impactful. Time's up, are you yelling at me? Great. I hope, I hope it did DC proud.